Dallas and Oklahoma City was a really interesting game yesterday. 117-95 the final. Big takeaway number one for me, I, I'm just in. Oklahoma City's here, man. They they were better in round one than I, than I thought they would be, and maybe I'm bamboozled. Maybe Dallas wins the next four. But Oklahoma City very much looked like the team that is locked in and playing at a high level on both ends of the floor last night. And Dallas looked like the team that was deer in headlights. This is the biggest moment of the year. And they didn't quite know how to handle it because the way OKC pulled away late in that game, I thought was super impressive. Yeah, I think OKC just, they look like a team that is almost more mature mm-hmm. than than you think they are. Yes. Like a team that you're you're surprised at every step by them, that mm-hmm. they're, they're showing like a level of maturity that yeah. I didn't think they had. Now that's not to say that we're going to see that carry through the seven game series. I, I want to sure. see it play out, but I, I think Minnesota also and their game one showed and, and the game two mm-hmm. showed that their maturity level is higher than we thought it was. Mm-hmm. And that's where you start to like, I think the whole entire up, like the whole entire playoff pic- picture can be turned upside down, like very quickly. Mm-hmm. I now can envision a Western conference finals with Minnesota and OKC. Yeah, and that was not the case. Oh, it wasn't the case it was, last week. It was impo- Yeah, it was impossible. Like, no, uh, just, Denver's going to roll through Minnesota. Maybe, in, maybe it takes them six, but they're yeah. going to beat Minnesota, and they're just going to roll through to the finals. This is the first time all year I've felt like, oh, Denver is not the best team in the West, mm. and I, I don't. They're they're definitely not. But maybe the Timberwolves are just a bad matchup for them. But when you're talking about teams and playing good basketball right now, Oklahoma City is is right there with with Minnesota for, for me. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you know, like you brought something up here too, that I think it's like super important that, um, like how does OKC move forward here? Right. Dude. Like, like OKC is in this weird position where they still have so much draft capital and they can't, they can't just select these guys. They already have too many players that are good players. And what they've been able to do is, is draft a bunch of first round picks and then weed through and see who works out and who doesn't Mm -hmm. and move off of those guys pretty quickly and bring in another group every year. And you're like, okay, this is, this process is different than anything I think we've seen before where they, they just kept like continuously using their cap space to absorb bad contracts and draft capital again and again and again. And then because they have a great general manager who knows how to find talent, they end up, you know, building all of this this young core that is so impressive mm-hmm. and your your thought was well you know are they going to go chase somebody dude that is my biggest fear i, I totally get it uh, you know what well, like if i'm them i start using my draft capital not this year because this isn't a great dr- draft but i start using it to accumulate higher draft capital so i can go after much higher end players yeah. So if I'm gonna like if I'm looking at next year's draft and there's a player that again, a point guard that could be your long term answer and you've got like again twelve draft picks, mm-hmm. I might trade six draft picks for the number one pick in the draft if that that player is there. Or wait until the next year. Why not? And, and just trade all that capital and then build the team, continue the organic build that they're doing where you can afford to pay your players as long as you're reasonable and you're not doing anything silly. Right. Um, but also, like, there's no reason to upset the balance of what you're doing. Like, it, keep it together. I, I don't think Sam Presti would do that. Because I don't think, I think they're looking at this and going, hey, we're going to have trouble keeping all these guys. They're not going to go throw a big contract into the mix. Well, they could. I mean, we talked about Donovan Mitchell just a minute ago. What if Donovan Mitchell says, hey, I want out? And, would you blame them for raising their hand saying, we'll take him? Kinda. Depending on what you're giving up, I just, I wouldn't screw with this, man. I wouldn't either. I, I unless yeah. unless Sam Presti is like Donovan Mitchell, and again, these teams know their their rosters way better than than we do. But maybe Sam Presti looks and goes, Hey, Donovan Mitchell is the piece we need for this thing to hit its ceiling. Mm-hmm. And in which case, okay. Maybe you try and work out that deal. But just like we talked about with the Knicks and all those reports that they're going to pursue Devin Booker, we just see that we see time and time again that organically growing your team and letting players play together over several years is such a better way to build a contender 
than, hey, we have some good players. Yeah, hey, we might have maxed out this very specific version of the roster. Let's blow it up. And let's get a star in here, and then we'll pick up where... Because no, now you got to go back to square one. And maybe the star helps you accelerate things, but now you have a new ceiling. And I, I you watch Oklahoma City, and you go and you realize that all of them are like 24 and younger. And you're going, dude, you have a seven, eight, nine year window here, potentially. Oh where, yeah. Where you're just now, you're just getting started and you're up one, nothing in the conference semifinals. You can go to a conference final, just get, just picking up experience left and right, just vacuuming up experience. I don't know why you would mess with that. I think that would be a, if, if you're a Kings fan, you should be open for it. Like, yeah, hey, here's the, this team that might just be hanging out at the top of the West for the next eight years. Yeah. Yeah, topple that. No. Because I think that's exactly what would happen. See, and that's where the, the weird thing is about where the Kings are, is that they have to find a way to get back into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to do. That's a big, a big swing. No doubt. Like, I'm not sure that, like, the in order to get into the upper echelon, and we see who the upper echelon is. It's it's really three teams. Mm -hmm. It's Denver, who should be good for another four to five years. Mm -hmm. But it it's Minnesota, who should be good for another four to five years. And then OKC. And this which is just has got like, That's got like eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you're, again, you're facing Boston, who's got like a, another five-year window. Maybe a little bit less because mm -hmm. some of their, their other pieces, but you, they're always going to have the mm -hmm. two studs. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think it really puts it in a weird situation where and you're almost like you have to hit a hit a button at some point that says we're all in we're all in on this and this is what we're going to do to try to compete and here's the other thing that might accelerate that is right now today the kings are in a higher tier than a team like utah or san antonio or houston mm -hmm. but those are teams that houston l loves where they're at right now yeah and they're looking at their roster and going hey we're going to need to take a swing at some point it may not be next year. They're, they're on a little bit different timeline than Sacramento, but that's another that's another couple of teams that Sacramento is going to be competing with here. You don't think that there are stars in the NBA. It might suck in San Antonio, and maybe people don't like playing there. But you don't think there are stars in the NBA that are itching to play with Victor Wembanyama? Yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be a ton of competition, and that's why I don't want when we talk about the Kings off season, which you know uh, we're going to kind of do throughout throughout the summer, but that's where the the urgency kicks in a little bit a little bit more and it's not to slam the panic button it's not to say that that oh they, they they need to blow it up it didn't work this year so obviously they need to change something it's like no it's just a matter of at some point there's going to be a new boat coming around and you're either going to get on that boat or you're not and another one may not be coming yeah and that's gonna that's i mean that's what the front office has paid the big bucks to try and figure out. But when we talk about big swings and we talk about trading this guy or trading that guy, it doesn't come from a place of, yeah, this guy's not good enough. It comes from a place of, and there's going to be another team ready to make this swing. And when they do it, they may be leapfrogging you. Yeah. And you've already seen it. You've yeah, already I'm, seen teams leapfrog you. You, you have to figure out a way to get back into the mix. And, and that's, it's not a, an easy thing to really do. Really tough. <laughs> yeah. Especially, I mean, it comes, sometimes it does come down to like, what kind of draft capital do you have? What mm -hmm. kind of expiring contracts? Mm -hmm. What kind of, you know, what kind of young players do you have to throw in on a deal? And then you're dealing with a team like OKC who has Houston's pick this year, potential for Utah's pick this year. Next year, they've got the first round pick of the Miami Heat, Philadelphia 76ers. The next year, they have an additional pick from Jesus. the the Rockets or Lakers uh, <laughs> or Clippers. Um, in 2027, they've got Denver's first round pick. Uh, they've got another uh, Clippers potential pick. Uh, 2028, they've got Dallas's first round pick. Uh, 2029, they've got Denver's first round pick. Jeez. Like it just keeps going, and the second round picks they have. They've got 30 of those as well. You're just like, what in the world? How in the world? It is insane. They've just amassed so much of a war chest where, hey, Danny Ainge wants to put it out there that's going to take five or six first round picks for Lori Marketing. Boy, would Lori Marketing work with the Oklahoma City Thunder? Is that a, a thing that upsets <laughs> the balance? Especially because you could swing that, I bet, without giving up players. Yeah, you might be able to. Or at least maybe you're giving up like a case in Wallace or something. Yes. But you're not giving up Jalen Williams. You're not giving up Chet Holmgren. You're no. not giving up Shea. Man. 
Yeah, so it, it's it's crazy, right? You have Lou Dort as your specialist off the bench. He's going out there and stalking people. The fact that Lou Dort has turned into a 40% three-point shooter isn't fair. It's wild. It's wild. It's ridiculous. 916-909-1320 to join the conversation. 916-909-1320. Mitch in New Jersey. What's up, pal? Hey, Kyle James. How you guys doing? Huh? Good. Yeah, great. Beautiful day over here. Um, I went to Kings. I didn't even decide. I didn't get three scores. They needed a big man. And I do have a couple of assets. So I, why can't they find a couple of guys in the second round? Besides their first round pick, who go Oklahoma? Who, by the way, Oklahoma has a lot of draft heads that's the next five years. Yep. And same thing with Utah. But Oklahoma, I think they're going to make the final uh, this year. I think Port, I think Port has a lot of things on his mind. I thought the reason I see why Denver's up down 2 0. But Oklahoma's got a lot of talent. Yeah. Yeah, they sure do. And, and one more thing. Yeah. They got, t- they got talent. They can't draft any guy that's the last name is Williams. Because it kills me when I when I'm trying to listen which wins they're talking about. Yeah. Because they got a couple of uh, well, one's a start. I'm sorry. Thanks for taking my call. Thank, thanks, Mitch. Appreciate you, dude. No, he is spot on about the Jalen Williamses. Well, yeah, they cannot draft another Jalen, but I, I could see them looking for another Jalen Williams because why not? It's worked. They're both effective. The previous two times. Yeah. What if you just amassed a roster of like five Jalen Williams, just like. Not even basketball players, just random dudes well, named Jalen Williams. What is happening here? You're like, man, I've been a plumber for 27 years. Why are you? <laughs> I can't play basketball. Uh, J Dub is the big man, right? Is that right? I think or so. Is J Dub the, the wing? I don't know. Now I have to look at basketball reference. Yeah, you do that. Figure out who is who. <laughs> you do that. Um, anyways. Yeah, man. Oklahoma City is going to be around. Um, I think you look at a team like, and that's, we talked about Houston. We talked about Utah a little bit. Mitch just brought up, brought up the jazz as, as a team with a bunch of assets and, and, uh, you know, Victor Weminyam and the Spurs are going to be lingering. Although I have no idea what, what their plan is moving forward, but I, I, I have, I don't want to say, I don't want to, no, no, I don't know. I don't want to talk about, I, no, never mind. I just, it's fine. Okay, so I'm worried. I'm just, I'm, I'm a little worried about the Kings. No, it's, it's okay to be worried about like their place in the world. And- I just don't want to. I, I didn't want to sound like I was overreacting. And the way I was initially going to say I'm worried about the Kings made it feel like I was being overreactive. But it's just as we, the more we talk about this, and the more we talk about like, man, all these good players and all these teams with assets, then we kind of look at where the Kings are. It's like, man, they, they've got a steep hill to climb. With people gaining, yes, or teams gaining. Well, that and and the fact is, you're not going to be in a position for a long time to either have true cap space or to be a team that has a high draft pick, unless things completely go wrong, unless you mm-hmm. have massive injuries to a couple of players and it puts you back in the top five, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you get better? Mm-hmm. A- and that's a difficult thing. And how do you push your all your chips in? At one point, how do you know when your team is right? How do you know? Yeah, like you really have to be looking at each of these indiv- individual players that you might go out and chase and and say, like, is that someone that can potentially be a starter on a championship mm-hmm. quality team? Can they be a player that comes in and just gives me so much more than what I have right now mm-hmm. that they can get me over the hump? And, and not only that, but how do I compete in a market that looks like this? Yeah. And that's the difficult thing. And I, and I don't know all the answers for how they can do whatever sure. it is. I can tell you the mechanisms that they have to get mm-hmm. better and all that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like we just don't know who's who's truly available and who's not and, and who's truly interested in what the Kings have and who's not. And these are all questions that like that Monty McNair has to be working the phones like nonstop because yeah. you have to be realistic about who and what you are and your place in the world and how do you get to the next mm-hmm. spot? And I, I think the Kings are in a position where they might be one big piece away from jumping right back into the fray with these teams. Mm-hmm. But as of today, they aren't in that position. I mean, clearly they didn't even make the, the playoffs. So, yeah, but they're so close. I, I would, it's almost like I would rather be in their position than so many of these other teams that are around them. Because if I'm looking at like a team like the Lakers, the Lakers are just aging out. You're looking at the team like Golden State. They're just aging out. And these are teams that 
either tied or we're right at where the Kings are, yeah. you know, in the standings. Yeah. And then you're looking like, even if we look at a team like Houston, Houston has a bunch of intriguing talent, but they have like very, like a very small pathway to piece all of these talented yeah, players no together. And no we doubt. have no idea what they'll look like in three years. They could look brilliant like OKC, or they could look like every Kings team from <laughs> like 2012 <laughs> until 2019. Sure where they just have too many young players and it doesn't work. And mm-hmm. then the talent that you brought in to support them isn't enough. So I think you're in a really, really like, you're not in a bad position. Even I would look at like the Dallas Mavericks and what they're doing and how they're building. And I don't think the Kings are far off of the Dallas Mavericks. Now, do they have the highest of highest end player? Yes. But at the same time, the Kings have a, have better all around talent like the talent around those players to me has been better over the last couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. And so you're sitting there waiting to see how it is that the Kings can take this next step. Mm -hmm. They've got a young player that might be able to grow into something special, but you, you only have a certain amount of time to put these things together. It shouldn't Mm -hmm. be panic, but you know, you put it all together in one giant bin and you've got Mike Brown entering the final year of his contract. You've got, you know, a, a bunch of, guys that are on expiring contracts, you mm-hmm. don't really have all your draft capital. Yeah. Like there, there are enough question marks to sit here and like make you uneasy about who they are. Yeah, the other, the other, the other thing just while we're, while we're talking about uneasiness is I like Keon Ellis as much as anybody, but we went into this season going, man, Hey, you're going to get growth from this player and this player and this player and this player. And then they didn't, you saw somebody like Kevin Herter come back to earth a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you you didn't see the same level of contributions uh, up and down the roster the way the way we did two seasons ago. Harrison Barnes. Harrison Barnes. Thank you. Yeah, That's another one. Um, and so I I sit there and I go, well, Keon Ellis is gonna be good again, but it's like, eh, but what if he's not? <laughs> what if he's not cashing threes at the rate that he did? Hey, that's that's just. Anyways. No, no. What if he doesn't I, hold up? What? It, no, there's a I'm lot of questions there. Negative Nancy. Right no, no, no. I, I get your negativity, but I also don't think you're being negative as much as you're being realistic. Sure. And so that's like, as a, as a general manager, we talked about it yesterday. Like if you have a five-year plan, you have no plan at all. Mm-hmm. Right. The Jerry Reynolds line. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like you have to, you can't just mortgage your entire future on an all-in move that, on a one year contract or something like, well, and that's what, and that's as we, as we go through this. And I, again, this is not about, this is not, this is not to say that the Kings are in a bad place. It's just when you start to look at what's in front of them in the, in the West and what they're kind of aspiring to. And then you look at a couple of the teams, you know, coming up from the bottom of the West. And again, not all the teams that are, that are coming up from the bottom are going to be good. I, I think you're right. Maybe, maybe the, maybe the Spurs n- never really get, really good complimentary pieces for Victor Wembanyama, and Or maybe it of, takes five years. Or may, right. Maybe it takes a while. Yeah, Maybe their window and your window are two different windows. Yeah. So that I could definitely see the rock is just flaming out here in the next couple of and, years. And Utah and Utah. Same thing. So Even Memphis, Memphis, mm-hmm. that like I they've lost see, a lot of pieces. Right, Who so knows if it all goes back together. It's not to say the Kings are in a bad spot. It's just as we started talking about all these things, like, man, they have a, they have a long way to go, which is where my next question comes in. And we're kind of doing this on the fly, but as we talk about this, where are you, James, as we talk about the Kings roster building, where are you trying to get them in 24, 25? Because for me, everything I I talk about when it comes to making these moves is like, Hey, how do you get as close as humanly possible to those three teams that were Denver, Minnesota, Oklahoma City. Those are just going to be the, the three teams we're talking about. How do you get as close as possible to those teams? Or is the expectation, no, you're just trying to get up to Dallas, New Orleans, teams you're, you're really close to already anyways, and getting back up into that four or five, LA, the Clippers, just trying to get up into that four or five where you're just like, yeah, you're solidly a playoff team and then go from there. Yeah, if I'm like, if I'm the Kings and I'm looking at that, I mean, you have to swing for the fences. Like you, you have to go get a big name piece that, that fits. And is not only that, but like, I would caution fans, like what you don't want is like the instant gratification piece. Right. So like if somehow you were able to get Paul George, Mm -hmm. right. 
but Paul George is 33 and is already talking about like he, he sees his, he envis envisions his life without basketball. I'm not sure that that's the guy that you, ch I mean, Paul George, what he looks like on the court versus Paul George, where he's at mentally and where he's at physically mm -hmm. and where he's going to be in like three years. Like, I, I'm not sure that I go down that route. Same thing mm -hmm. with Jimmy Butler. Like you go get Jimmy Butler. What do you, what do you got? Like a year or two of Jimmy Butler being like this giant personality. And then he's just poof gone. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those are the moves that I'm always leery on. It's really the move that, you know, again, we can talk about Laurie market. If he ever became available, it's the Brandon Ingrams of the world that are around the same age as your stars right now and can fit in and be part of something that lasts for five to six, seven years. And you hope that, you know, you can hold to hold it together and keep adding pieces here and there. That's kind of the move that I would look for. You got to find a guy who's, who's 25, 26, 27, maybe 28 at the oldest that is really close to all-star level or is an all-star level player. And you got to go all in um, because I think that's the only way you jump back fully into the conversation. Yeah. I'm not sure that a tweak here, a tweak here and a tweak there can get you back up to the six seed, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that a tweak here and a tweak there gets you back into the conversation can get you into the conversation sure. that some of these other teams are in. And like, look, the Kings aren't the only team uh, like the Pelicans have topped out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and for that matter, Dallas might top out. The difference we'll is talk about Dallas next segment. I'm yeah. so fascinated by them as a team. Well, that and the difference is that Dallas has a 25 year old superstar that might have more to offer in a different way. Yeah. A and realistically, that's the difference with with why I feel differently about Dallas than I do say New Orleans. Um, uh, same like I, I wouldn't want to be the Clippers right now, I, like because we're talking about how how do the Kings get back to the like, OK, you're going to run it back with a bunch of aging guys against a bunch of. 25 year olds who just already mm -hmm. told you how good they are mm -hmm. and ran right by you and mm -hmm. jumped to the top of the league. Okay. Regular season success seems to mean nothing, right? Like for, for in the grand scheme of, of basketball, the Warriors won 73 games in the 2015, 16 season, but it, it doesn't matter because they didn't win a title. Like that's, that's, that's what, but I, I think at the same time, that's a fan sentiment. That is how fans look at things. It's like, it doesn't mean a thing without the ring. That's yeah. the, yeah, yeah. Whereas front offices, just with like with the Clippers specifically, with what Matt Ishbia talked about with the Suns, front offices look and Matt Ishbia and the Suns are going, we made the playoffs. What are you talking about? We need to, we need to blow this thing up. We make a couple of tweaks. We're moving up. Steve Ballmer, he's moving into a new building. They won a bunch of regular season games. He's looking at that and going, yeah, it's a 50 win. That's 50 wins right there. Let's bring those three guys back. We have 50, maybe, maybe not in the playoffs, but hey, I know we're going to win 50 games. I know we're going to put butts in seats in the regular season. Mm. And that's a little bit of the, the, the team building juxtaposition that I think is there where as a fan, you're going, how do you win a title? And I think there's a, a team owners definitely want to win titles. They definitely want to win championships, hang those banners. Like there's a, the gratification of it, B the financial incentive behind it. But then I think there's a lot of people that are just like, hey, how do we not become irrelevant? And that would be what I'm afraid of the Kings doing mm. is going, hey, how do we not become? OK, we may not win a title and we may shorten our window by six years, but we're going to make this all in move right now to make sure we're a four seed and we get to host a first round series. That would be a massive concern for me yeah the as far as like bringing in the older guy who yeah and just might like be able hey, to here's this like, big name yeah the instant gratification move yes yeah no no i'm like, terrified like no 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 don't do that i would oh. no we make the move that that makes sense <laughs> for who <laughs> of how you've been building this thing the whole time yes but i'm a sucker and a clown so if they got jimmy butler or paul george it would take me a week max to talk myself into it. Of course. <laughs> but you'd have to like, you'd have to do it with the understanding that it was the all in move. And if this thing doesn't work, like number one, people are getting fired. Yeah. Uh, but number two, like it's such a small window. Like mm -hmm. you, you, you just cracked a window and it's not even really a window because right. these other teams have already ascended to a certain spot. And you only hope that that guy can help carry you through as opposed to playing team basketball and trying to get through as a group together. So it's, it's a tough spot to be in, man, because you can see both, 
both angles. You can see where, like, it's easy to see where Houston could jump above you next year and Memphis could come back and be part of the fold. And all of a sudden, you're you're on the outside looking in completely, mm -hmm. not just a team that couldn't get past one Pelican squad and so you didn't make the playoffs. You could be a team that that is now on the outside and, and looking at a bunch of $40, 50000000 million players and you're not good enough. Yeah, man. Tough. Really tough.